Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a great break. My name is Layla Weiser. I am the director of the editorial and project management staff in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and CEDAR. Today, I'm going to be providing an overview of policy document options, development, and oversight. Just want to take a step back for a moment, something we really believe strongly in is that everyone deserves confidence in their next dose of medicine. So pharmaceutical quality assures the availability, safety, and efficacy of every dose. Today's presentation, I'll go ahead and provide an introduction of OPPQ, provide examples of policy documents that OPPQ manages, go through the common themes of the policy development process, and then really kind of focus on that. What does it mean to me? How does all of this fit together? Where does it fit within the regulatory framework? And then finally, we'll provide information on how to engage with OPPQ if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. So why OPPQ? We looked around and found policy offices existed throughout the other CEDAR centers, and they had different approaches to policy setting in those offices. So OPPQ was created to have a dedicated office with dedicated staff to focus exclusively on pharmaceutical quality. As you've probably imagined, pharmaceutical quality is a topic that touches all products regulated by CEDAR and CBER, and it touches all UFA programs. So it's a really large net and a very important one. This is a long list of the example of work products that we work on. These are anywhere from regulations all, all the way to individual policy to questions and issues. I won't read through them all, but it gives you a sense of the different groups that we tap into to be able to provide assistance in this space. So let's start off with guidance for industry and talk a bit more about that. I have provided the link here if you'd like to go to our public facing page where you can search through guidances by topic. So what is a guidance? A guidance assists industry in carrying out its obligations under laws and regulations on subjects such as the content and submission of applications and the design, production, manufacturing, and testing of regulated products. You may not realize, but there actually are two different levels of guidances that we develop here within the FDA. Level one guidances provide FDA's initial interpretation of new or revised significant regulatory requirements. And then there's something called a level two guidance, which usually addresses existing practices or make minor changes in FDA's interpretation or policy. When we're developing guidances, there are also two stages to development. The first one being development of a draft guidance, which describes new or significantly changed policy. They're published for public comment through a public docket, and they're not for implementation. Final guidances then is our next stage, and that's where we incorporate those public comments provided after a draft or a revised draft has been published. And because we're finalizing it and taking public comments into consideration and incorporating them, it's considered FDA's current thinking and therefore is appropriate for implementation. We also have non-binding versus binding language. FDA's guidance documents are generally non-binding. So when you open up one of our guidances, you'll often then see the text there in quotes, which talks about representing our current thinking on a particular topic, and that you also have an opportunity to provide alternate approaches if it satisfies the requirements and to contact FDA to do so. But in rare cases, where Congress has given FDA the authority to issue a binding guidance, we can use partially or fully binding guidances. And that means then that the guidance would include binding language. 
And just to give you an example like, of what we do when we have that binding language, the guidance on comparability protocols for post approval changes to the chemistry manufacturing controls information in an NDA and or BLA has both binding and non-binding language. I provided a link, go ahead and take a look when you have time and you'll see how we can go back and forth between those, but also what different language we use to set off the different types of requirements that we have. So another type of policy document that we work on routinely is a manual of policies and procedures, which we call MAPS. And I provided the link for that right here on this cover page. If you want to search for our MAPS, they are very available externally. So what is a MAP? Policies and procedures primarily intended to direct CEDAR staff in the conduct of their work, so directives, and they're going to be published in a MAP then and it serves to disseminate the policies and procedures. Most maps are posted for public view for the purpose of transparency, but unlike guidances to industry, maps are really not intended to provide guidance or to gain public comment from the regulated industry. We do have map categories and different types of review. For categories, we have a standard map, an interim map, and then internal maps. And the type of category really then is an, it's intended then to determine whether it's for internal or external audiences, and that really is driven by content of the document. And we have review cycles as well. The maps are periodically reviewed to ensure continued relevance and effectiveness. And then a third type of document that we work on is called a compliance program. Again, I've provided the URL if you want to take a look at the programs. Although this is intended for our internal audience, it's something that we provide transparency to and post externally. So what is a compliance program? It provides instructions to FDA personnel for conducting activities to evaluate industry compliance with the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and other laws administered by FDA. And so while we have different types of policy documents, the life cycle that we use to develop these policy documents have many similarities. So this is an overarching structure of how we would go about developing policy within our office. We first need to focus on prioritization. As you might imagine, there are competing priorities throughout. So we really need to first consider then statutory priorities, but then also UFA, public health emergency agency and center priorities. So it's not something office specific or something that we're personally interested in. This is a holistic review of what needs to be taken care of to ensure public health. We then form a working group and that's where the policy right of, and development happens. And once that document is developed, it goes through clearance and then ultimately publication. Then we need to also consider once it's been posted though, how about implementation? We need to consider whether staff need training or what sort of communication we need to share with our colleagues in industry and other external stakeholders, but also internal business partners. But our job isn't done because we want to continue to revisit that policy that we put out. So we have a policy document review process, which ensures periodic review of our documents to ensure continued relevance and effectiveness. So I mentioned at the earlier stages here about understanding the regulatory framework. We work on all these different documents, but how do they all fit together? So let's start with regulations. Our regulations lay out policy requirements at a really high level. So for example, not every testing method would be discussed in a regulation. But when you look at a guidance to industry, it provides FDA's interpretation of the statute and regulations to provide recommendations on specific topics. So the example I provide here is extractables and leachables. And then we look at maps and compliance programs, which is our opportunity to internally operationalize what we have stated in guidances and regulations. 
So the really important thing here is reading those together is how you can get a better understanding of FDA requirements and recommendations. I'm going to provide some examples for you within the regulatory framework how one document type might be a little different than another. So the topic we're going to look at for this first example is about allowable excess volume and labeled biofill size in injectable drug and biological products. We wrote a guidance for industry to provide recommendations for industry uh, to comply with the uh, CFR for injectable liquid, solid, or reconstitution drugs while mitigating an appropriate excess volume. So the guidance we use then is used to understand the relevant regulatory framework, and that is applicable regulations and FDA's recommendations on how to address this issue in your application. And you'll see in the example here that the guidance clarified our regulatory requirements and recommendations and then describe when justification is needed for proposed excess volume. And then it discussed the importance of appropriate fill volumes for injectable drug products and provided recommendations for fill sizes. And I provided a link here so you can go ahead and take a look at that document on your own time. But let me move on to the next slide. And on this slide then, again, same topic, but now we have a map written about this topic. It's called Map. 5019.1 revision one, which describes how CDER OPQ will consistently assess fill volume for injectable drugs. So here you're intended to read the map as an internal reviewer, but also those of you are able to review it externally because I, mean, I mentioned it's uh, posted externally, but you're gonna read that map to understand what OPQ assessors will be looking for in your application. And you can use this map then to double check your understanding of the guidance. So in the map, we describe policies and procedures for product quality assessors to ensure consistent assessment of excess volumes. We also address liquid, solid, and drug products that require reconstitution and constitution. And then finally, we describe the policies and procedures to be used by OPQ product quality assessors to ensure it, the drug product is sufficient to allow for withdrawal and administration of the net content, container content of the drug products. So you can go, we take that deeper dive, and we really provide that understanding to our assessors of what to look for. And again, for that, then I've provided a link to that map if you want to take a look at that and see the distinction between the two document types we provided as examples. Let's go over a second example with a different topic. This topic is process validation for drug manufacturing. We're going over the different types of statute and regulations relative, relevant to process validation. We talk about 501 and then 21 CFR and 211. If you take a look at those, I won't read through them because they can be a little clunky to get through, but you can see these relevant provisions of FDA statutory and regulatory authority to understand the relevant requirements. But when you move on to guidance, again, now we're on example two, the same topic of process validation for drug manufacturing. We developed a guidance on process validation for general principles and practices in January of 2011. That specifically outlined general principles and approaches that FDA considers to be appropriate elements of process validation and then incorporated principles and approaches that all manufacturers can use to validate manufacturing processes. And then it allowed you then to align process validation activities with the product life cycle concept and relevant ICH guidances. The point of this being that you would use the guidance to understand more fully how to design and implement process validation activities. Like the other slides, I've provided a link here if you want to take a look at that guidance to get a sense of the tone and the approach used to provide that clarification. And in this example, we even have an example of a compliance program for this same topic. So the compliance program here is about post-approval inspections. Remember, this is an internal document for our FDA personnel. It describes how FDA will assess, among other objectives, CGMP compliance regarding process validation life cycle activities for approved drugs. And then it provides risk-based strategies 
for the scope of inspectional coverage and clarifies roles to establish efficient communication. So boiling that down, you read this compliance program, even externally, although it's intended for internal staff, again, it is provided externally for transparency, but you would read this to understand what process validation information FDA investigators may evaluate when inspecting your manufacturing facility. So a very, very useful tool. And again, collectively then provides a really great overview of FDA's expectations and hopefully can clarify then what your understanding is of our needs. So I want to provide some final thoughts. So the big thing is here, remember, when you're looking at a draft or finalized guidance, also look for a related map or compliance program to provide further insight into the guidance. You saw these examples that we just went through and what a build it is and that there's different layers. It's like a tapestry to be able to better understand the topic and our interpretation of a topic and how we're advising staff even to consider that topic. Maps and compliance programs, that's how we operationalize our interpretation of a rule or regulation. So they're really going to help understand FDA's practices and how FDA ensures consistency. These policies at the end of the day, going back to that first slide about what is important to us, they're intended to be understood and used to ensure our goal of safe, effective, quality products. So how to engage with us? We have a dedicated email address that you can send any questions or comments to. It's cedar slash opq slash inquiries at fda.hhs.gov. We take comments and questions from all of you very seriously and make every effort to be timely and thorough in our responses. I really just also want to take a moment to thank you all. This has just been a great opportunity to strengthen our partnership with you. I hope that this particular presentation has afforded you the opportunity to see what these documents purposes are and how collectively we use them to really frame that regulatory framework. Thanks so much for your time and I appreciate it. And back to you. Hello, I'm Teresa Mullen and I'm going to talk today about enabling pharmaceutical quality management through international harmonization of standards. But effective pharmaceutical quality management is necessary to ensure against quality failures, supply disruptions, and drug shortages. And it typically requires post-approval changes to be made to regulatory filings because facilities age, routine operations may require updates to maintain GMP compliance, Regulatory requirements change and technology evolves, suppliers may change, and, and companies may generate new knowledge about products and processes. And regulators around the world want to encourage effective pharmaceutical quality management to enable companies to make those changes and keep making those uh, innovating and applying what they learn in commercial operations to continually improve. But post-approval changes can require separate prior approval from each regulatory authority where the product is marketed. And uh, that can create complexity. Now, for one regulator like FDA, that picture on the top here may be what we see, which is we get a post-approval change sub submitted. And uh, we're doing our review based on our timeline, and we provide a response back. But for a company, it might look like that picture on the bottom where they're submitting that post-approval change to multiple different regulators who may even have different requirements um, and uh, different timelines, come to different conclusions, and the company needs to wait uh, to hear from all the parties where they've submitted in order to proceed. And this can create some delay, uncertainty, and uh, in some cases, it may discourage a company from doing what we want them to do with managing quality. So regulatory reliance ultimately could help with this, uh, reducing this kind of complexity. But we can even begin to reduce this kind of complexity uh, very critically by harmonizing the regulatory requirements in different regions. So the same things are expected by regulators in different regions. And, and um, this then would provide a comparable basis for our regulatory assessments, 
which then could enable, if, if other conditions uh, are appropriate, to actually rely and use another's work product, rely on and make use of another regulator's work product or their assessment or their inspection report to support and inform our um, assessment of post-approval changes. Of, co of course, companies would need to be receiving the same uh, quality dossier for that to happen. But foundational here, and that's why I have it read, <laughs> is that harmonization of regulatory requirements is really key to enabling these things to happen. And ICH is where we do this work. So the International Council for Harmonization of Technical Requirements of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, uh, this is why we just call it ICH, uh, is a unique harmonization organization that involves both regulators and industry. It was launched initially in 1990 by the US, EU, and Japan. And it had well-defined objectives which hold true to today, which is to improve the efficiency of new drug development and the registration process, really reducing duplication, uh, aligning standards, um, and getting rid of unnecessary differences, promoting uh, public health by, for example, reducing the duplication of clinical trials and unnecessary animal testing that isn't really needed to generate that evidence that we need of safety and effectiveness. And this is accomplished through the development of these harmonized technical standards and guidelines, and then the requirement that uh, regulators in different regions will implement those guidelines. Although it started out as having six members, three industry, three regulators, in those founding regions, today we have 21 members and 36 observers at ICH. It's really a truly global operation. And with the regulators, if you think about how powerful this is, that regulators committing in all of these different regions to implement these guidelines. So ICH has um, produced quite a few. Uh, this is as of last year. There are a few more now, but um, as of November 2022, 72 guidelines in different topic areas, 16 guidelines in the safety, that's animal safety studies primarily, 25 guidelines in the quality space, uh, 22 for efficacy, and nine in the multidisciplinary area. That includes um, electronic standards for the transfer of, of regulatory information, notably the electronic common technical document, uh, modules two and three uh, being where we have the quality information, and MEDRA, which is the ter standardized terminology for adverse event reports. So how are these guidelines developed? Well, there's a five-step process that's pretty standard for all the guidelines. After a new topic is approved by the ICH assembly, an informal work group is established, and they develop a concept paper which outlines the scope of what will be done in this guideline and the time frame in which they anticipate doing it. And that is after being approved by the management committee. And um, uh, that document, that concept paper, then um, will provide the basis for the group to be established and the work that they're going to undertake. The first step in this process is consensus building um, among the industry and regulatory experts to produce a technical document. When that's produced, it's forwarded to the assembly for approval, first by all parties, and then a second piece of that is just by the regulators to review and adopt it. And why does it switch to just regulators? Because at the end of the day, this recognizes that the regulators are the ones that are going to be implementing these guidelines, and they need to own it um, and in order for that to happen. And so then it goes into a step three, which is really the public consultation or public comment period in, in, in our FDA parlance. And uh, after the comment period closes in all the regions where that's being undertaken, those comments are gathered up. The group reconvenes to go through all the comments and address them in the revised guideline as needed. And that results in a step four guideline, which is the equivalent of FDA's final guidance. Following that is the implementation step, which is very critical to the effectiveness of ICH at, at all, because if we don't implement consistently in different regions, we won't get that benefit of harmonization. And so training is really critical at that at following that implementation stage to ensure that there's correct and consistent implementation of the guideline around the world. So in the quality area, we have a number of really critical guidelines and the shorthand names here may sound very familiar to, to many people. And um, so overall, we uh, these guidelines focus on 
you know, pivotal milestones like the, the conduct of stability studies, defining the thresholds for impurities, a flexible approach to managing quality, product life cycle management, continuous manufacturing, and so on. And I'd particularly draw your attention to the Q9, quality risk management, Q10, pharmaceutical quality system, and life cycle management for the quality management topic. Now, there's an annex in Q10 that really lays out the progression or increasing levels of quality management maturity that a company might um, uh, basically demonstrate and how that translates into a more risk-based and flexible approach to regulatory oversight, starting with just basic GMP compliance, which is kind of the status quo and um, minimal. A company might go on to having a for an effective pharmaceutical quality system, PQS. They may further demonstrate product and process understanding, and so on. And there's a progression there. Well, this guideline was put together in 2008-9 timeframe, and um, and there was not as much uptake of it as was hoped. And so uh, Q12 was in part a, a response and a further uh, sort of addressing of this of this need and opportunity. Now. Q12's full name is Technical and Regulatory Considerations for Pharmaceutical Product Lifecycle Management. We refer to it as Product Lifecycle Management. Provides this framework to facilitate the management of post-approval changes in a more predictable and efficient manner. And really, how can increased product and process knowledge help reduce the number of regulatory submissions? Providing very explicit tools and enablers to kind of operationalize you might say, what was in the annex of Q10. And notably, um, a company coming up with established conditions, um, the post-approval change management protocol, which lays out the strategy, product lifecycle management, and so on. So in summary, effective pharmaceutical quality management requires a life cycle approach. And it includes post-approval changes to regulatory filings. But many post-approval changes require prior approval by each authority where the product's marketed, this can generate regulatory complexity and operational challenges. It's burdensome for regulators and industry. And ICH works to harmonize the technical requirements for quality management and those regulatory submission formats. So these are an involve uh, Q and M guideline work. ICH harmonization work is undertaken by regulator and industry experts. And it can take several years of pretty intensive work to produce a consensus guideline. But the resulting guidelines enable regulatory consistency and efficiency, and they reduce the uncertainty and risk for companies trying to manage quality. An effective management of quality is really necessary to ensure the availability of medicines that are critical for patients, and this is true globally. And with that, I thank you. Hello, my name is Mahesh Ramanatham, and it's a real pleasure to be talking to you today on FDA's implementation experience with ICHQ12. Hopefully today, I'll be able to walk you through the foundations of the guideline and the guidance document for FDA, um, how to utilize some of the tools most efficiently, and also share with you what we've been seeing when it comes to the use of ICHQ12 and submissions um, and their benefit to the application overall. All right. So you've seen this already, but I'll put it up here just for fun anyway. Let's go ahead into the actual content of the presentation here today. Um, as a reminder, hopefully you all have read ICHQ12. It has been out for four years now. Um, and our implementation guidance has been out for uh, two years. Hopefully you are all familiar with that. And if you are not, I highly encourage you to read those two documents um, as they really paint a broad picture of um, how to use ICHQ12, its goals, what it intends to achieve, and uh, best uh, ways to approach the tools. But for those that have not read it, ICHQ12, as we call it, Technical and Regulatory Considerations for Pharmaceutical Product Lifecycle Management, um, really utilizes all the best tools in Q8 through Q11 to provide a framework to facilitate the management of post rule CMC changes in a more predictable and efficient manner. And really, the take home here is as applicants better utilize the tools that we have in ICH Q8 through Q11, it provides the opportunity to present scientific justifications to reduce the volume of elements that would be uh, CMC changes that require a filing to the agency and 
offer the opportunity to reduce the reporting categories that go along with it. So overall, less, uh, less things that need to be reported to the agency um, at a lower level if the tools are used correctly. And really that's summarizing that third bullet there, um, that when, those, when the Q8 through Q11 tools um, in the Q12 manner is used in a stronger fashion, opportunity for fewer established conditions when it's weaker um, or less robust uh, is likely going to be more established conditions for the applicant. Important note here is that the, the use of ICHQ12 is voluntary. Um, implementation is also flexible in the sense that the proposals for specified established conditions on a product lifecycle management document uh, can happen at any point in the life cycle. It can happen with the original application or can come in as a uh, post-approval supplement um, to identify and define uh, the established conditions for a particular application product. Um, it's also flexible in the sense that it can be used for as little or as much of the CMC sections of the application as the applicant desires. For example, it can be defining these EVECs for one specific unit operation. If that is where the applicant chooses to invest their time and resources in deploying ICHQ-12, it can be for everything uh, in module three, you know, from your drug substance and drug product, uh, manufacturing processes, uh, container closure systems, analytical methods, um, manufacturing facilities, et cetera. The uh, flexibility spans that spectrum. Okay, a little bit on where we are with ISCHQ-12 from an FDA perspective, just to paint the overall picture um, before we go into more detailed discussion of the tools themselves. Um, so we adopted ICHQ-12 in 2021 as a Step 5 document, and that replaced our 2015 draft guidance on established conditions. Um, that guidance was no longer necessary um, as ICHQ-12 became reality, and we can now point to that as official FDA policy. So in parallel to the adoption of ICHQ-12, the parent guideline there, we also published FDA's Implementation Considerations guidance, Draft Guidance Document in 2021. And the goal there was to identify and clarify how applicants working in the FDA system can translate the terminology, translate the approaches um, to use here in the United States, as well as accounting for some specific frameworks um, to the FDA system uh, that still offer the opportunity for using, using ICHQ-12 tools. So for example, using them in the frameworks of uh, referencing a drug master file, um, uh, using a drug product uh, sorry, a drug device combination products and how to approach established conditions for those types of, of, of drugs, um, et cetera. And finally, what we are working on is a manual of policies and procedures, which is going to really focus on specific procedures for the assessors on how different disciplines encountering ICHQ-12 tools, uh, specifically proposals for established conditions and reporting categories for those established conditions, are going to work through the assessment um, both from the application side of things and the assessment of facilities and the pharmaceutical quality system side of things, and how those come together to make initial decisions uh, in support of applications, as well as to maintain or how to respond to maintenance um, after approval of those particular applications. Okay, so the scope of ICHQ-12 itself, uh, this is a, a summary of the guideline, uh, so I won't read it verbatim. But the real take home message here is that when it comes to ICHQ-12 and the FDA, um, we've had no limitations on the scope. We are fully implemented across uh, anything that Q12 can be deployed to per the guidance. Um, we are open doors um, for, that, uh, for those approaches for applicants. All right, and similarly, we have a, a new number of tools in ICHQ-12. And the point of this slide is not to go through every single one in detail, but to really highlight that uh, through these numerous tools that we have in ICHQ-12, um, the applicant really should be looking at these as a suite. Um, how to utilize all of these uh, in conjunction or to the best of their ability to really open the door for maximum opportunities when it comes to justifying uh, fewer established conditions and lower reporting categories. Uh, again, the real take home here is that within uh, IFDA, um, we have fully implemented ICHQ-12, so all of these tools are open for business. Um, and again, coming back down to the applicant to decide um, how to best approach it um, uh, and pursue maximum benefit. I'm not going to spend a time today going through every single one of these, but I did want to bring particular attention to established conditions, uh, PACMPs, or as we call them in the United States, comparability protocols, uh, how it all works together in the product lifecycle management document, um, and then the pharmaceutical quality system being that underpinning and that foundation of 
um, efficient implementation of Q12. So what are established conditions? Um, if you haven't read uh, the guidance documents, uh, either the parent ICH Q12 or our implementation considerations guidance document, um, you know, this is a very important time <laughs> to pay attention and listen to what ECs are. Um, so ECs are legally binding information within the application considered necessary to assure product quality. As a result, in the context of ICHQ-12, um, as a result, any change to an established condition would require um, reporting to the regulator. Now, a big sort of take-home message here is to recognize that an application today um, is a mixture of established conditions and supportive information. And some of those established conditions examples that we all see in front of us uh, you know, it could be the actual drug substance, the drug product formulation, the manufacturing process and its controls, the specifications, the facilities, et cetera. Uh, not uncommon, and hopefully is not news to anyone hearing this presentation, that when these elements are changed, there's an expectation uh, for reporting to the, the application, whether that's a prior approval supplement or a change is being affected, et cetera, um, maintaining the file um, to account for what's currently going on in any one of these uh, particular areas that are established conditions. Uh, but not everything in the application is an established condition. For example, uh, the data supporting method validation or the data supporting stability or the data supporting process validation or process development approaches. Um, those things, when they are maintained, don't themselves necessitate a filing to the application um, to gain approval from the regulator for any sort of change. We would consider that more supportive information. So the concept of established conditions, which exists today uh, in the regulatory frameworks, um, is really to highlight here that the application is a mixture of both. Uh, but when you change the established conditions element, uh, that file will have to come um, to the regulator for either a notification or approval. Um, a real important message, though, when it comes to Q12 implementation is that all changes, no matter whether they're reported to the application or not, require a change management approaches under the pharmaceutical quality system. Okay, so when it comes to Q12 implementation, I kind of mentioned this early on, but I'll come back to it again in the sense that the extent, i.e. the number and how narrowly defined of the established conditions will vary depending on multiple factors. So how much product and process knowledge does the applicant have? Um, what way do they gather it? How can they use that information to justify their proposals for established conditions um, and their, their grasp and kind of mastery of uh, demonstrating or, or showing the potential risk to product quality if that element were changed uh, given their product and process understanding, et cetera. Now, after identifying the established conditions, applicants can propose uh, various ways of managing those established conditions, i.e. how they would report them to the application. Um, a lot of flexibility here as well. Applicants can propose uh, and, and choose to follow existing regulations and guidance. For example, uh, here is a list of established conditions, but when changing them, I'm just going to follow, rather the applicant will just follow um, 21, 3, uh, 20, 21 CFR 314.70 if you're a small molecule product or 21 CFR 601.12 for a large molecule product and any implementing gui guidances on uh, the types of uh, reporting categories for, for specific changes for example, the SUPAC guidances. Alternatively, an applicant has the opportunity to propose different reporting categories based on their knowledge of the product and process and their knowledge of risk uh, when managing a particular change. For example, an applicant can say uh, and propose in, in their uh, submission that even though SUPAC would have this particular change reported as a prior approval supplement, the development knowledge that's been gained, the platform knowledge that's, been, that's available um, as well as the risk management assessment uh, of this particular established condition and its link to uh, quality attributes holds that we can change it, or rather it can be changed um, with a lower level of risk than what is normally expected um, or normally considered uh, to be the level of risk. Hence, let's report this that a change is being affected or even an annual report instead of a prior approval supplement. Those are opportunities that are available to the applicant depending on their desire uh, to pursue those those proposals and I'm happy to report that we have seen quite a few of them um, and have approved quite a few of them uh, dependent on justification provided by the applicant. Um, okay now this is a figure that we have from ICHQ12 itself 
And I've always found it to be a fairly uh, good picture um, how to work through the thinking of what I just talked about in the previous slide as far as identifying the established conditions and then the reporting category. And you know, the way that I think about it is above the red line there, those questions and outcomes are, are geared towards is the thing um, an established condition. Below the red line is, well, for that thing, uh, if it were changed, what would be the reporting category? And that top element there, this is a, a figure specific for uh, manufacturing process parameters. It can be applied in its thinking across different elements of CMC. Uh, for example, the performance uh, characteristics or primary performance characteristics for a device constituent part. Um, in our implementation guidance, we have uh, an adaptation of this figure um, to combination products. Um, you know, it can be applied to analytical methods and really focusing in on the you know, characteristics or perform elements of that method that assure performance uh, of that particular method. But here with process parameters, just to, to flesh it out even more, um, when we talk about uh, parameters, you know, looking at whether or not that parameter needs to be controlled to ensure product quality, and that can be thought of in a few ways. One, is it a, a critical process parameter, um, or is it a process parameter where the impact on quality cannot be reasonably excluded? There's not enough information yet, or there is some uh, signal of a potential uh, relationship, however more work needs to be done. And depending on the answer, yes or no, um, it could be determined an established condition or not an established condition. Um, if, it's, if the answer to those questions are no for this particular process parameter, uh, it could be reasonably justified as not an established condition, in which case it's not reported to the application. Now, that's not to say it's not managed um, and that all changes must be managed by the pharmaceutical quality system. It just provides the opportunity where that particular change doesn't require an annual report or a CBE or a PAS um, and the waiting for approval from the regulator. On the other hand, if you are an established condition, it will be reported to the application if changed. Um, and the second half of this diagram walks through how to apply Q9 type principles um, in considering the output of the criticality assessment and the control strategy to identifying the potential risk to product quality if that particular parameter was changed. Higher risks would trend, trend towards prior approval. Moderate or lower risks would trend towards notification type changes, which in our FDA system would be your CBEs and your annual reports. Okay, now I had previously talked about how the difference in uh, development approach or product and process knowledge and understanding available or platform knowledge available uh, could lead to differences in the established conditions. And what we have here is a screenshot from the ICHQ-12 implementation working group training materials, um, which are available in ICHQ, uh, sorry, ICH.org. Um, if you search down and, and scroll to ICHQ-12, there will be a link to our training modules. Um, and this is a screen grab from that particular, one of those, one of those um, uh, uh, presentations, excuse me. But what it shows here um, is that depending on the type of approach, uh, whether you know, knowledge is gained in a very superficial fashion under a minimal parameter-based uh, approach, uh, contrasted all the way to the right side of the screen, where there is a knowledge-rich environment of the interaction of parameters to quality attributes, um, such that you, uh, and potentially even using technologies where there is online controls um, and ways of, of uh, you know, feeding back information from the process um, into the control of that particular unit operation. Um, you know, uh, consider that a performance-based approach where there's maximal knowledge um, and control of the process itself. And what you can see is that now, these are not meant to be three distinct approaches as far as the only ways of doing things, but they are meant to illustrate a spectrum um, of minimal knowledge to maximal knowledge. And along the spectrum, if you look left to left to right, um, you will see that the things that are established conditions change, as well as the reporting categories associated with them change, to where on the left side you have more established conditions requiring filings to the, to the application of change. For example, look at your equipment type, your V-Blender. Uh, it is an established condition, and if it were changed to a different type of equipment, it would be at least a CBE 30. Moving across the spectrum there, you know, uh, a situation where there is enhanced knowledge under a parameterized approach, uh, that risk might come down uh, to a, a lower notification, uh, notification low, potentially a CBE zero or an annual report, to the more, uh, the other end of the extreme, and the performance-based, where Perhaps the applicant is able to justify that the type of equipment doesn't even matter anymore, and it can be controlled as far as the quality of material can be controlled 
uh, independent of the type of equipment to where the applicant has full flexibility to change that equipment without reporting it to the agency. So let's shift gears a little bit here from established conditions now into another tool that's available in ICHQ-12, uh, what we call the Post-Approval Change Management Protocol, or PACMP. In the U.S. system, PACMP is the same as a comparability protocol. Please look at our current guidance on comparability protocols, and you'll find extreme congruence with the content that you see in ICHQ-12. Um, but for the purposes of the presentation, I might use PACMP and CP interchangeably. Um, if I do, I'm talking about the same thing. So a PACMP, what it does is provide predictability and transparency in terms of the requirements and studies needed to implement a change. Um, and if those requirements and study requirements are met and studies are, are conducted as expected in that change management protocol, providing the opportunity for a lower reporting category when implementing the change. The beauty of a PACMP um, is that it can be utilized for one or more changes to a single product or maybe you could use across products when that change is common um, and the characteristics of that change is common across products. For example, you know, potentially a, uh, you know, a simple liquid formulation injectable product utilizing a container closure system, glass vial and stopper. Um, think about the opportunity to uh, change the glass vial and stopper for multiple products at the same time using the same protocol. Uh, PACMP, much like established conditions, has extreme flexibility in when it can be proposed to the regulator and that can be submitted with the original application or subsequently as a standalone supplement. Okay, so what could that look like with a PACMP? So with a uh, change management protocol, step one will usually involve the submission of the written protocol in the form of a prior approval supplement to the regulator. And that will go over the tests, the studies, the acceptance criteria, et cetera, where the regulator can then look at the plan, look at the proposed outcomes of the plan and provide feedback or concurrence in the form of approval. Um, to that particular supplement back to the uh, the applicant. If approved, we now have that transparency built in on how to approach a particular change uh, between the applicant and the regulator. Step two is then the applicant actually carrying out the tests and studies in the protocol. Um, and if everything goes as expected, uh, the results of the data generated meets the acceptance criteria, any other conditions specified uh, in the approval of step one, um, that information will then be submitted to the regulator pursuant to the reporting category agreed upon, usually a lower reporting category than what would normally be expected, um, and can go forward with implementing that change. Uh, this can be done potentially at a notification type level, for example, a CBE um, or an annual report, giving more flexibility for, for, for streamlined and quicker change implementation. Um, however, depending on the category, you know, there may be situations where certain changes might need to come in at a prior approval supplement. For example, if the uh, uh, protocol acceptance criteria were not met or if significant changes had to be made to the protocol, or if the risk of the change was agreed upon to be just too high uh, to necessitate a notification or support notification. Okay. So you might be asking yourself, what's the difference then between established conditions and a change management protocol? Um, in reality, they are fairly well aligned and pretty close together. Um, and they all share some common characteristics, which you can see on the first three rows there. A major difference is that with a change management protocol, you are getting the uh, alignment up front um, on the approach and studies and access criteria and defining those up front um, to the regulator in the form of a uh, submission of the protocol to the application. With the established conditions, it's a much wider open sort of approach uh, in the sense that the applicant is justifying uh, what would need to be reported and at what level based on the available either development knowledge or platform uh, product and process knowledge um, at the time of that submission um, and giving you know flexibility through that sort of mechanism. All in all, this all comes together in the product lifecycle management document um, or the PLCM as it's called in ICHQ-12. And the PLCM is a central repository of the established conditions, the reporting categories, details on the details of the established conditions. For example, if it's a, a process parameter, the range of that process parameter um, or the controls around it, um, specificity in the reporting categories, so not only one will it follow uh, US regulation and guidance, um, or is it something different that's proposed? For example, a lower reporting category, um, but also clarity on 
uh, potential situations where the reporting category could be different. For example, if uh, going you know, uh, beyond the lower end of a range uh, is a lower risk, that might be a lower reporting category than going uh, beyond the higher end of the range, that might be a higher risk and a higher reporting category. So directional-based reporting categories um, having an opportunity in the PLCM as well. Uh, now, after so all the ECs in the reporting category should be proposed and transparently uh, captured on the PLCM. After approval, uh, the applicant should be maintaining the PLCM with an updated list uh, every time they make a change to an established condition, um, as well from a pharmaceutical quality system management perspective, um, looking at opportunities to uh, identify changes to ECs overall, um, those should be provided to the regulator too. So I mentioned early on about our draft guidance, uh, ICHQ 12 implementation considerations for FDA regulated products and kind of what that does. Um, I had already mentioned sort of, um, you know, how to use the ICHQ 12 tools in our system and accounting for our frameworks. Um, but the guidance does go into specific considerations that applicants should be aware of to be most effective in utilizing Q12 in the FDA system. So for example, clarity in the cover letter regarding proposed ECs to be as explicit as possible that this submission contains proposals for established conditions and a PLCM in module 32R in the application, for example. Um, clearly, and uh, clearly, sorry, clear and specific identification of the ECs in the PLCM, the reporting category and justification. So, you know, uh, being as black and white as possible um, in the PLCM about what is the established condition, what is the reporting category, um, and not being vague about it. Um, and clearly indicating the facilities uh, in the PLCM, clearly indicating where those established conditions will be implemented. For example, if we're talking about uh, established conditions for the drug product manufacturing process, to clearly concatenate any established conditions associated with the manufacturing process under the facility identifier um, for the drug product manufacturing operation. So we had briefly talked about um, kind of the PQS being the foundation uh, of ICHQ-12 implementation in that you know, while only some uh, changes will be reported to an application, all changes are expected to be managed by the PQS. Um, and kind of diving into further about why this is so foundational to Q12 implementation, uh, in that the effectiveness of a PQS really provides confidence in the proposals for established conditions. Uh, by allowing the regulator to see that there's a feasible and robust control strategy, that we have competent quality oversight for maintenance activities post-approval, that we are confident that all relevant data has been uh, assessed and considered, um, uh, anything that's been generated by a particular facility, and that the change management procedures are, are competent. Um, we go on to talk about ICHQ-12 about how an effective change management process across the supply chain, across facilities that are linked up together and making a particular product is essential because we really can't be thinking about the risk of changes within the silo of one particular uh, element. It really needs to be broadened out and at least account for upstream um, or downstream impact. Um, and I mentioned this on the previous slide about maintenance, but really knowledge gained, knowledge gained during the commercial phase is a, is a key element of that post-approval confidence um, that even after approval of a PLCM and the appropriate, uh, sorry, the established conditions, that as new knowledge is gained during manufacturing operations or changes in suppliers, uh, routine stability, et cetera, um, that there is a periodic reassessment of criticality and risk and searching for any needed changes to established conditions, which goes both ways in the sense that an applicant might learn something that gives them the opportunity to reduce the established conditions, um, to remove something that was previously thought of as a risk, but maybe is no longer uh, with the uh, additional knowledge gained. Um, alternatively, the opportunity to add established conditions uh, for better life cycle control if new risks emerge in the context of routine operations, et cetera. Uh, this diagram he uh, here is from ICHQ-12 and it really puts into a picture um, the relationship between the pharmaceutical quality system um, managing changes uh, inside of a particular facility or at the applicant level managing changes. And on the red part of that diagram, um, the linkage up to established conditions and notification. So you see that the change management lifecycle is really agnostic uh, to whether or not 
it needs to be filed to the application and that all changes are being sort of managed under a consistent approach. And then in certain cases, the red dotted line um, over to the red box, in certain cases, some of those changes need to be reported to the application. What Q12 is doing is essentially making that red box smaller um, or giving the opportunity for applicants to justify a smaller red box than what would be normally expected under regulation and guidance. But all of it kind of really depends on the effectiveness of the PQS. Um, and knowing that this cycle, this approach, um, is going to be uh, well implemented. Okay. So thinking about pharmaceutical quality systems, what would it mean for inspections? Um, so if you are an investigator uh, or if you are being, uh, if your facility being inspected, uh, when it comes to Q12 implementation, there's no expectation for investigators to review established conditions. Um, that will be done through the application with the assessors at headquarters. Um, however, the inspection is an opportunity to gather information on the effectiveness of the pharmaceutical quality system. Um, and for those that are paying attention, you will notice that we have updated our surveillance compliance programs and our pre-approval inspection compliance programs to add content um, about advanced pharmaceutical quality systems, about the change management effectiveness, et cetera, that in part supports um, ICHQ-12 implementation. Uh, so as investigators looking at kind of these other areas of the quality system, particularly change management, uh, it will help gain uh, more evidence and more knowledge and more insight that can further drive flexibilities in uh, Q12 proposals from applicants, or at least our assessment of them. Um, but important to also know that if an inspection identifies a violative situation to facility, um, it may impact the approval established conditions. It may also impact the viability of previously approved uh, established conditions to where changes might need to be reported at normal levels under regulation and guidance until such time as that facility is out of a state of um, violative compliance status. All right, so what have we done to get ourselves in a position to implement Q12? Um, long story short, we started five or six years ago on training FDA assessors and investigators on what ICHQ12 is, um, how to think about the, uh, the, the change in thinking when it comes to letting science and risk drive some of the proposals for established conditions. Um, you know, that went all the way from theoretical examples to the you know, output of the pilot assessments that we did in 2019, all the way through implementation of Q12 and the, uh, the implementation considerations guidance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this, this uh, also impacted the inspection compliance programs. These train, this training and this exposure, you know, was available or, or deployed to our assessors in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, our colleagues in the Office of Regulatory Affairs doing the inspections. Um, as well as colleagues in the Office of New Drugs and Generic Drugs for awareness on what Q12 is and what it could mean um, to applications as they come in the door. In the day-to-day -day operations, now that we've uh, opened the door and applications are coming in, um, we found the need to ensure continuity in the assessment um, in the early stages, especially as you know assessors were really starting to see submissions in real time. Um, so we, we stood up two groups. Uh, the Established Conditions Coordinating Committee and the Q12 Assessment Implementation Team. The ECCC is really there to provide regulatory support to the assessment teams, helping them think through the policy, think through congruence with ICHQ12, and ensuring that any decisions or communications or language that we send back and forth to the applicant is supported by that policy. Whereas the Q12 Assessment Implementation Team um, members there, you know, represent our senior scientific folks across disciplines. We're there to help the teams really think about criticality assessments, risk assessments, and whether or not proposals for ECs are well justified. Um, in addition to those two groups, a member from each one of those two groups joining the assessment team, we will also have a new uh, discipline of pharmaceutical quality system assessor join the team to really look at those facilities where ECs are going to be implemented uh, and whether or not there are any concerns with pharmaceutical quality system health, change management effectiveness, et cetera, that could influence decisions around um, established conditions and reporting categories. So here's a snapshot um, from the pilot implementation through September of 2023 of the types of applications that have come on board and sort of where we are with status. Um, and as you can see, the concentration is really in the innovator space. I mean, at this time is really in the supplement space too, where we're looking at uh, proposals coming forward for established products, um, you know, have been approved uh, fairly recently, 
And prior approval supplements are now coming in to you know, define a list of established conditions and reporting categories. Um, you know, a lot of activity in the biologic license application space, in the new drug application space, but not a lot of acti have activity in the ANDA space. Where we are right now is a, a lot of supplements coming in. We're starting to see things start to tip over into more original applications um, coming in the door uh, to, prov to actually build in this flexibility uh, on the day of approval. Um, uh, which is a good, I think, sign uh, for things to things to come. But again, this is designed to be flexible, so it can happen at any point in time in the life cycle. For example, if a business model holds that it's not viable to do this at the original application stage, but it's better after there's an established product, um, that door will always be open for applicants to come in with PASs after approval um, and reduce their supplement burden um, and implementation in the global space. Um, the types of ECs that we have seen, kind of the flavor of them. So we have seen everything from uh, proposals to reduce the volume of reporting, uh, sorry, volume of established conditions uh, where reporting categories are consistent with the regulation and guidance. We've also seen, um, you know, the, the, actually the bulk of the proposals where the reporting category, category proposals are more flexible um, than uh, regulation and guidance. Um, and it's been really nice to see the supporting justification for both the established conditions and the reporting categories, um, which by and large have left us in situations where we can approve these applications. We've seen a mix of the types of ECs, um, you know, whether it's a parameter-based approach or a performance-based approach, where there's a lot of knowledge, maybe in some feedback mechanisms, et cetera. Um, but happy to say we've seen this across the spectrum for both manufacturing processes, analytical methods. Um, we're starting to see uh, proposals for uh, device constituent parts of a drug device combination product um, and uh, you know a very positive element as far as applicants proactively specifying by facility um, where the established conditions will be implemented for example you know we've had a few applications with uh, dual facilities doing the same operation for a particular product um, and the ECs within each facility are a little bit different by virtue of differences in equipment um, differences in operations and controls, uh, but nonetheless having that clear specificity on the PLCM allows for you know confidence in the approval uh, as far as what we are approving and the ability to drive the uh, PQS assessment. So our reflections, um, you know, the next couple of slides are going to go over uh, things that we have seen, um, also kind of you know allude to common information requests that we're sending back to applicants um, to uh, get clarity on particular proposals. Um, but reflections from our initial experience, really what helps Q12 implementation, or at least the submissions um, uh, for Q12, are clarity in the cover letter um, so that the agent, agency can start off immediately um, in assessing these uh, applications with the right teams. I mentioned on a previous slide that we have three additional members of the team joining when an application includes proposals for ECs and alternate reporting categories um, in order to get them on board at the right time seeing it up front in the cover letter is incredibly important. Um, so whether that's proposing ECs or revisions to already approved ECs, um, or, or as simple as making changes in accordance with approved ECs, um, it's important to have that kind of clarity so that we can tailor the teams appropriately and maximize the time um, in assessing these applications. Scientific justification is a huge element when it comes to the success of Q12 um, applications and their approvability. Um, really like, you know, looking at these three sort of bullets here, the justifications really need to focus on explaining the approach to criticality assessment. You know, early on we got an inkling that some applicants were worried that what was in Q12 uh, would be calling them to change their company uh, approach to risk assessment or criticality assessment to conform to what was there in Q12. And that's not the ask. The ask is a clarity in explaining how uh, an applicant went about criticality assessment and risk assessment so that uh, the team is when they're assessing these proposals for ECs and reporting categories has the contextual understanding about why the applicant is proposing, you know, a certain level of criticality or a certain reporting category level um, to then frame out whether the justification makes sense. So the ask is not to change, the ask is to explain so that the assessors know what they're looking at. 
Um, again, that's the second bullet there, right? That the uh, justifications and risk assessments should clearly describe the scientific rationale for why something is considered an EC, or in some cases, why something that would normally be considered an established condition is not in this case. Um, same thing for the reporting categories. And one thing to highlight here, especially if an applicant is considering filing a PAS to uh, document established conditions or gain approval for ECs for an already approved application, is to really ensure that the justifications for those ECs and reporting categories are current um, and are actually justifying the ECs and the reporting categories and not just the parameters that were approved for the process. Um, in more than one situation, we saw justifications that were pointing back to data um, or, or studies conducted for the original application approved, you know, five or 10 years ago to where they even, even the thinking around established conditions didn't exist. The justifications didn't really make sense. Um, so really think about when you are proposing ECs and reporting categories that are using the principles in Q12 and the implementation guidance to frame things in the right way uh, to support justifications for why this particular element should be an established condition, why the reporting category should be at this level, et cetera. Okay, um, some more reflections. The PLCM um, really needs to include all the ECs for that relevant ECTD section. Um, you know, we found a few situations where looking at module three and looking at the justifications, what, would, what was identified by the applicant as critical for control, critical quality attributes, or the direct linkage there, did not show up on the PLCM. Um, and there was no explanation of it. So we had to um, uh, rectify that difference. Um, as well, the PLCM should clearly state that record, reporting category um, when different than regional regulation and guidance or be really clear that we're following regional regulation and guidance and should do so in US terms. Um, there have been uh, a few times where we, you know, applicants have used the Q12 terminology and we'd had to, we've had to go back and clarify Specifically, what do you mean for a U.S. filing? When you say notification moderate, does that mean CBE 30 or CBE 0? We need to be explicit um, so that the agency has confidence in what we're approving. In the same way, the PLCM I mentioned this earlier needs to be clear about the, uh, the facility identifiers where those ECs are being approved. Um, again, because that's going to drive um, FDA's assessment of the pharmaceutical quality system, um, which is really looking at you know which facilities will be implemented, but also depending on the level of flexibility proposed, that will tailor the depth of assessment um, of the pharmaceutical quality system. So where uh, you know, there is flexibility in established conditions proposed or lower reporting categories than we normally expect, you know, our assessors look more into those ICHQ10 principles, uh, change management effectiveness, et cetera, uh, to see if the, you know, the, the support is there um, to maintain ECs post-approval. By and large, our interactions with applicants have been fairly positive, um, you know, receptive to our information requests, modifications that are necessary to the PLCM have been made. In some cases, uh, you know, after, when, like for example, when asking for justification or clarification, um, applicants I think have, have withdrawn uh, proposals for established conditions if they particularly weren't ready to justify them. Um, and in the case of a prior rule supplement on such a short clock, um, but they have been the minority, um, count them on one hand, uh, where these situations have happened. Um, and happy to report that to date, we've not denied approval of an application due to Q12. So very good success across the board so far, and I hope we continue that and expand it to more application types um, and more stages in the product life cycle. We are so supportive of Q12 and its benefits uh, to pharmaceutical product quality management um, and the life cycle, for example, in being more agile uh, and making changes to avert shortages or respond to shortages or increases in demand, um, that we have applied Q12 principles during the pandemic, for example, with um, container closure system changes. Uh, we continue to address common misperceptions and questions by engaging with the industry and uh, other regulatory partners. And we've been supporting global implementation of the tools, for example, PACMPs, um, in various forum. Um, we continue to support the ICHQ-12 implementation working group. The ICMARA pilots had a big focus on PACMPs and the approach to risk assessment. And we continue to share our experience with other regulators to help uh, you know, lower the global activation energy when it comes to the adoption of Q-12. And not to mention um, our linkage to, of Q-12 to other related ICH guidance documents, for example, F4Q and revision two, but also looking ahead into ICHQ14, 
um, where we talk about analytical methods. Um, and you can even see the DNA in ICHQ13 uh, when it comes to continuous manufacturing. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. A huge thanks to the ICHQ12 teams across the world, uh, whether it's the expert, implementa expert working group or the implementation working group. Huge thanks to the FDA ICHQ12 uh, EWG and IWG teams, um, some key members here. Um, but uh, you can see on the third bullet there, the network is much, much broader than that. Uh, when it comes to our uh, support teams, our ECCC teams, and our Q12 assessment and inflation teams, um, you know, the thanks cannot be uh, ex uh, repeated enough. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up and i um, happy to engage with you further. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dong Mei Lu. I'm from Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality. Today, I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk about nitrosamine research studies inform FDA on potential strategies and bioequivalence approaches. These slides talk about the importance of a pharmaceutical quality. The outline includes the challenges of NDSRIs in drug products, and secondly, FDA-sponsored research project to support reformulations of impacted products, and lastly, FDA's considerations based on the research results. Nitrosamine issues has evolved very rapidly. There are two classes of nitrosamine generally. First class is the small molecule nitrosamines such as NDMA or NDEA. In general, they have a relatively simple chemical structure and they are not related to the chemical structure of the API. It has been found in many drug products. NDSRI is another class of nitrosamines. They share the structure similarity to the API or the API fragments. NDSRI are formed during a drug product manufacture or during a shelf life or storage conditions. APIs with a secondary or tertiary amines are exposed to the nitrocyting uh, compounds such as nitrite impurity in the excipient and they can form NDSRI under the acidic conditions. Many drug products are impacted by nitrosamine impurities. It is very challenging to determine the acceptable intake limits for each NDSRI because each NDSRI is unique to each API or the API fragment, and there's not much data available on the mutagenicity or carcinogenicity. FDA has recommended three potential mitigation strategies for NDSRI back in November 2021. That includes the first one is to screen excipients for nitrite impurities. And the second is related to the reformulation by adding small amounts of antioxidant. Some research paper has indicated that some certain antioxidants can inhibit nitrosamine formation. And the third is also reformulation by adding uh, pH modifiers in the formulation. Because uh, nitrosamine formation is very favorable at the acidic conditions. If a basic pH modifier is added into the formulation, the microenvironment will be changed in the drug product, then potentially it could inhibit the NDSRI formation. FDA also encouraged manufacturers to come up with the innovative approaches to resolve the nitrosamine issues. In order to evaluate the roles of antioxidants or pH modifiers in the solid oral dosage form, FDA has conducted or sponsored several research projects related to NDSRI mitigation. The first project is related to the quality. It is to investigate the risk of NDSRI formation in finished product formulations with excipients in solid states. And it's also studied NDSRI formation inhibition effect of excipients in drug formulations. FDA also sponsored two bioequivalence projects. The first project is a contract project by Pharmaron. It is to study the impacts of antioxidants on in vitro permeability of some BCS3 APIs. The second bioequivalence project it is a, a SSCSER grant, and it is to study the effects of antioxidants on intestinal drug transporters using the in vitro method. 
Next, I'm going to provide more detailed information about the three projects. Project number one, effectiveness of antioxidants in selected model drugs, mitigation strategy and impacts of reformulation on stability. Biometanide was selected as the API. Along with the other excipients, it was formulated as a tablet formulation. Three antioxidants were selected, ascorbic acid, caffeic acid, and folic acid at the different concentrations up to 1% of the weight of, of the formulation unit. And two kinds of uh, pH modifier are used. They are acidic pH modifier or a basic pH modifier by um, using sodium bicarbonate. In the wet granulation procedure, driving steps, 60 degree of heated air was used for this purpose. The different formulations were put into the stability chamber under three conditions. They are 50-75 for up to one month, 40-75 for six months, and then uh, 25 to 60 percent of relative humidity for up to six months. The figure and table in this slide demonstrate the inhibition efficiency by the antioxidants and the pH modifiers. And uh, it was demonstrated as the six months of stability under two conditions, 4075 and 2560. Among the antioxidants, ascorbic acid showed the strongest inhibition efficiency among three of them. And uh, it's followed by the caffeic acid and then a folic acid. With the increased concentration of antioxidants, the inhibition efficiency is also increased. For the pH modifier, the basic pH modifier by sodium bicarbonate showed the overall the strongest inhibition efficiency for this study. So uh, the take home message for this study right here is that small amounts of uh, pH modifier, especially the basic pH modifier or some certain antioxidant can inhibit NDSRI formations. Next, I'm going to talk about the two research projects on the bioequivalence because there are challenges in the bioequivalence for the products reformulated due to nitrosamines. As we all know, most of cases get impacted by the nitrosamines are in solid oral dosage forms. According to FDA SUPAC guidance, the addition of new excipients belong to level 3 changes. Typically, in vivo B study is recommended. But for the in vivo B study, it is going to cost a lot and also it spends extensive time to complete the studies. At the same time, FDA expects manufacturers to resolve the nitrosamine issues as soon as possible and complete supportive study within a certain time frame. In order to explore whether there are some other bioequivalence approaches for this purpose, FDA sponsored two research projects. The first bioequivalence project is on the effects of antioxidants on intestinal permeability of BCS3 drugs. BCS3 drug substance was selected because of their feature of a high solubility and low permeability. That means if there is some variation in the permeability, that would be the worst case of a scenario for the BE to be impacted. Four antioxidants were selected. They are alpha tacopharum ascorbic acid, cysteine, and propyl gallate. The maximum amount of 10 mg of antioxidants were selected because that was based on the calculation of a dosage units of 500 mg and give up to 2% of the weight of antioxidants. The IDAS system in vitro dissolution absorption system were used in this study. Basically, the CACO2 cell manolayers will grow on the snap well and then inserted into the permeation chambers. These two chambers were inserted into the dissolution vessels. Uh, the etanolol was used as an internal marker in this study. In this slide, the figures show the typical permeability observation for BCS3 drug substances when co-dosed with the antioxidants. For this case, it is a cyclovir, 
when uh, it's codosed with the alpha tocopherol at the different concentrations, the permeability has no significant difference from that without the codosed antioxidant. And in this second figure, that is a tenalog probability, it demonstrated that the cell monolayer has no integrity issue during the testing. The apparent permeability was calculated as a mean and a standard deviation. And this table summarized the results of permeability from a different drug substance when codosed with a different antioxidants at the different concentrations. So basically, the take home message is that the tested amounts up to 10 mg of this tested antioxidant do not have a significant impact on the model drug BCS3 drug substance permeability. The second bioequivalence project is on the effects of antioxidants in drug products on intestinal drug transporters by UCSF. As we all know, some nitrosamine-impacted products are substrates of intestinal transporters, such as PGP, BCRP, OATP to be one. First two are efflux transporters, and the last one is its influx transporter. And the membrane vesicles, which overexpress the intestinal transporters, are used for this study. There are four steps involved in this study. Step number one is creation of a library of 30 antioxidants used in the oral formulations, 22 of them from a FDA ID database and 8 from a natural product. Step number two. Each antioxidant at a concentration of 200 micromolar will be studied for the inhibition of the transporters. Step number three, if the inhibition effect was observed for more than 50%, the SIC50 of the antioxidant will be estimated. Step number four, the IC50 of the antioxidants will be compared with the estimated intestinal concentration just try to see whether there are any potential drug-drug interaction. The probe substrates in this study are listed in the table below. And to the table right, it gives the information of the uptake percentage of substrates when codosed with the antioxidant. The antioxidants listed in this table are from FDA IID database, which also showed no significant impact on the transporter activities. However, there were two antioxidants that show the inhibition effect to some certain transporters. They are ascorbyl palmitate and butylated hydroxy anisole. Then the IC50 value of these two antioxidants to the certain transporters are estimated and labeled right here. After that, the maximum intestinal concentration I got was calculated as well. Then the ratio of the I got over IC50 value was calculated and also compared with the 10. Because according to the FDA guidance on the drug-drug interaction, if this value is more than 10, then that means that there will be a clinical significance. But for these two antioxidants, all the, for all the scenarios, and the values are all less than 10. So that means these two antioxidants are unlikely to inhibit the transporter activities. As a summary, the project results support the proposed nitrosamine mitigation strategies and also inform other bioequivalence approaches. The quality project with the reformulations with the pH modifiers and the antioxidant indicated that these two reformulation strategies are valid. Small amounts of added excipients can effectively inhibit NDSRI formation. For the reformulated drug product, and for the BE considerations, the in vitro bridging studies such as a permeability or transporter activity study have great potential to demonstrate BE. The studied antioxidants at tested ranges didn't have any significant impact on the in vitro permeability of BCS3 drug substances or intest intestinal transporters. But more supportive data are needed for antioxidant levels beyond those researched or other type of antioxidants are used in the reformulation. Manufacturer can also consider some other B approaches such as PPPK modeling or IVIVC in vitro in vivo correlation. 
manufacturer can also uh, use different approaches for low risk versus a high risk product and uh, but need to provide sufficient justification for this uh, risk based approach. FDA encourage manufacturers to come up with a novel approaches. If uh, uh, under this scenario, please contact FDA for further discussion. At last, I want to indicate that FDA continues to consider different approaches for products impacted by NDSRIs and um, nitrosamines. With all the efforts, FDA wants to help industry to resolve the nitrosamine issues as soon as possible and to ensure the safety and efficacy of the medications to the public health. I want to acknowledge my senior colleagues from Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, Office of Generic Drugs, and Office of New Drugs. We have been working on that since 2018 and it has a lot of progress. I also want to thank the FDA um, OPQ OTR lab, Pharmaron, and the UCSF Dr. Geocommunist lab for conducting these three research projects. And thank you so much for your attention. Hello, my name is Pallavi Nityanandan, and I serve as the director for the Compendial Operations and Standard Staff in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality. Today, I'll be presenting about FDA USP collaboration, our working relationship, and partnership in the development of USP standards. Today, I'll be presenting uh, about the overview of FDA USP interactions as they pertain to the development of standards, then talk about the key mechanisms through which FDA interacts with USP. One is through the government liaison program and then through our active review and comment process on standards proposals published in the pharmacopoeial forum. And we'll then discuss the important role industry plays uh, in the development of USP standards. And then we'll take any questions after the presentation. FDA has had a long-standing collaborative relationship with the USP. FDA values engagement with external organizations that develop standards because standards enable consistency, predictability, credibility, and lead to better science-based decisions. USP is legally recognized in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act under Section 201 as the official compendium of the United States, both USP as well as NF, the national formulary, or any supplement to them has been recognized in this section. The USP and NF official standards for strength, quality, purity, identity, packaging, and labeling can be used by the agency to support any charges of adulteration or misbranding, which we will take a look at more closely in the next upcoming slides. The adulteration provision comes from Section 501B of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, uh, which states that if the uh, strength, quality, or purity of a product that falls under an official USP monograph uh, differs from the requirements of that standard, then they the differences have to be plainly stated either on the product label or in the uh, labeling. Um, however, the identity requirement in the monograph is mandatory and there is no um, option to label out of it. The misbranding provision comes from Section 502 of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, uh, where a drug or device will be deemed misbranded if it is not labeled with the official established name, which is the monograph title for a drug substance, drug product, excipient or even a compounded drug. The established name is the uh, monograph title and also the requirements for pa packaging and labeling must be met, anything that's uh, outlined in the monograph. There are some nuances for packaging, but uh, we won't get into that right now. As I mentioned earlier, one of the key mechanisms by which FDA participates in USP standards development is through the government liaison program by which FDA subject matter experts are allowed to serve on USP standards development committees. FDA representatives, mainly subject matter experts, serve on USP committees and panels 
and currently there are uh, part, there are about 100 and over 130 uh, liaisons or fda staff who serve in this government liaison role and in addition to cedar there are also government liaisons from various other fda centers such as the centers for center for biologics and uh, center for veterinary medicine center for food safety and nutrition center for devices as well as the uh, ora which is our office of regulatory affairs and their primary role is to provide input on behalf of FDA to enable better alignment between FDA's current regulatory thinking and USP standards in development, which we hope will eventually provide better clarity for stakeholders on various topics. And uh, because the topics are very broad in scope, they may need to bring back some of the information for internal discussion within FDA as uh, permitted. And uh, the, these interact, the overall program is coordinated by um, COS because um, the main purpose behind the coordination is for recruitment training, pre meeting, and also staying in touch with the government liaisons to advise them on policy and uh, enable better collaboration between various teams as we keep track of, of uh, overall progress on various topics. The other uh, important way in which FDA participates in USP standards development is through the active review and comment process for articles published in the pharmacopoeial forum. So we do have an active process of reviewing pharmacopoeial forum proposals and providing comments back to USP within the designated comment deadline. So when a, pr a proposed standard is published in a pharmacopoeial forum, we do an initial triage and determine who needs to perform the review and how widely it needs to be distributed within the um, organization. If we need to uh, collaborate with other centers out, outside of CEDAR, and then uh, we take the appropriate steps to send out these requests for review or perform our review internally. And a lot of times, uh, when we perform the review internally within COS, we still get the uh, opinion of others by sharing the review. Or there could be some cases where it is a proposal that's already gone through a revision cycle and there is just one aspect that's being addressed and we are well aware of what that is and we may not, we may choose not to send it out for extensive review. So when we get the comments back, we draft uh, the responses and a lot of times when it's a new general chapter or some complex topic then it involves meetings getting together various offices like we do have some different perspectives that need to be um, aligned and consensus reached before we send the comments back to uh, usp so um, then we will follow up through our government liaisons on discussions of those comments and the government liaisons may be able to provide further elaboration on the written comments sent on the PF. While we have a robust and collaborative relationship with uh, USP, there are also some unique challenges with the review and comment, especially when it comes to monograph and specifications included therein. So, um, because USP is a non-governmental entity, we are not at liberty to disclosing specific criteria or impurity names, etc. Uh, as when we comment on the PF proposal, so we our comments tend to be quite general, and then there has to be some follow-up that USP does with the industry, and then if they get additional information, they can confirm things with us, but uh, we cannot give them the specific in, and the direct information needed as to the what the range should be or what impurity should be included, et cetera, because they are considered as company confidential uh, trade, trade secret information. So uh, that's how the process works. And there is a lot of email, both pre-PF and also um, post-PF. There are a number of communications between FDA and USP just to check on specific aspects. 
This is a summary of how uh, the interactions work between FDA and USP for monograph development. When USP prepares a monograph proposal, they, they would uh, share it with the government liaisons for their uh, comments, but then the more detailed reviews happen during the PF stage where cost coordinates review with the monograph um, and with the review divisions within FDA and then uh, we collate the comments and send them to USP and then they would e evaluate our comments along with other comments from stakeholders and then uh, they will propose further revisions based on the additional information received and they the that new proposal or a uh, revision to particular aspects of the monograph proposal will be shared by email and uh, cost provides uh, feedback either uh, which is mainly involves just concurrence again we don't disclose any specific information and then usp finalizes the proposals for as official standards usp monographs are important to both fda and industry because uh, they are not only applicable to previously approved applications, but could also significantly impact a pending application's review. And a good monograph certainly improves the efficiency of the process uh, by providing information for product development, which could be very useful for the um, applicants, especially the generic drug developers. And also when uh, firms follow USP method and acceptance criteria, there is a generally more abbreviated requirements for verification or demonstration of suitability for use as opposed to a, a full-blown validation. Um, we have also been engaged with USP since 2010 uh, on modernizing outdated monographs for which they have done a great job and uh, updated many of the monographs because it's re this is really important because if the more outdated specifications are relied upon by um, applicants then it, it just slows down the review process and also can be misleading to firms they have spent time using something that may not be acceptable uh, to the agency now that you have heard about fda's process for reviewing usp pro standards proposals and um, some of the limitations we face and now I'd like to move on to emphasize the role of industry the important role of industry in the in contributing to a revision of USP standards so applicants DMF holders and manufacturers are um, recommended to have a robust process for reviewing and commenting on USP monograph proposals that get published every two months in pharmacopial forum and any other uh, notice of intent to revise which are posted um, that give you early advance uh, notice of an upcoming revision so, and also please consider uh, your data your batch data while commenting if your data indicates that your product can meet what's being proposed in the monograph then there is no need to petition USP for a wider acceptance criteria um, because you are already meeting what's being proposed you could just update your specifications at the next opportunity and uh, contributing improved analytical procedures to usp enable monographs being up to date so they are beneficial to public health this is to summarize some of the major ways in which we um, fda interacts with usp we have an active role in the review and comment of usp standards proposals as well as the monthly nomenclature ballots uh, which is mainly through the participation of our government liaison to the nomenclature and labeling expert committee and there are multiple um, emails on a daily basis from uh, both on pre prior to publishing a pf proposal as well as post pf inquiries and uh, uh, we talked about the government liaison program which is managed by COS and we COS staff also participate as GLs to some of the committees and uh, attend as observers as needed for uh, some of the policy issues. Uh, besides these, there are also some other routine engagement on broader policy issues between COS and uh, USP where we also bring in uh, other pertinent subject matter experts and uh, FDA staff as needed 
for topics that impact more than one exam one monograph for example um, additionally there are also uh, engagements with you with uh, industry and other stakeholders through usp and we have a fda usp quarterly meeting which involves uh, representatives from various fda centers as well as leadership and there are also some um, one on one or other um, engagement between uh, senior leadership of both organizations and uh, usp also plays a, a role in the usp convention which is which happens every five years we have six delegates from various fda centers and the commissioner's office we play an active role in the in submitting resolutions for usp to consider adopting as well as uh, provide feedback on resolution proposals and and throughout the cycle there are also activities of the council of the convention which is one of the governance bodies of usp and participate in the nomin nominating committee for the council of experts when it's time to uh, you know prepare for the new five year cycle last but not the least we also engage in pharmacopoeial harmonization uh, serving as a partner to usp in the pdg process in summary uh, fda very much values our collaboration and partnership with usp and uh, we believe that the standards uh, serve public health by providing a minimum legal standard and standardized quality and purity requirements for drug products across manufacturers which are developed through a open process that provides for broad stakeholder input and um, also we have different regulatory pathways for otc pro over the counter products and uh, prescription products and monographs provide equal equalized standardized quality and purity requirements for uh, drug substances and for drug products where monographs exist and uh, uh, usp standards serve as effective tools that can be used in fda review and enforcement activities and uh, for certain complex pro products such as the biologics uh, monoclonal antibodies etc fda supports non monograph standards and uh, performance based standards which is the direction usp seems to be moving in thank you so much for your time and attention i'll be glad to answer any questions you have at this time good afternoon i'm dr shaming shu I lead a group of researchers in the Division of Product Quality Research in OPQ. In the next few minutes, I'll briefly talk about Gudufa research and specifically focus on the translation of the research findings to support the development of product-specific guidances, or PSG. And I'll limit the scope of the discussion to complex products, as they are often more challenging to develop and hence more likely of needing research. The GDUFA program was first enacted in 2012, then reauthorized twice in 2017, and more recently in 2022 under the GDUFA 3. And in addition to aligning the user fees and review timelines, the GDUFA program also allocates resources to the FDA to fund research to facilitate generic development and review. Since 2013, FDA has awarded over 200 contracts and grants as well as conducted numerous internal research projects led by FDA staff. This research facilitated the development of new tools and methods which helped FDA and industry to evaluate the generic drug equivalents. A key outcome of this Kudufa research is to enable more efficient development and assessment of generic drugs, as well as improve resources for the development of PSG recommendations. And a key aim of the Kudufa research is to disseminate the research findings to improve the general understanding of these products and to aid the generic industry in their development uh, program. Therefore, results from these researches are shared through scientific meetings as well as peer-reviewed scientific publications. The product-specific guidance program, which began in 2007, aims at facilitating the development and approval of safe, effective and high quality generic drug product by providing FDA's current thinking and recommended approach for demonstrating equivalence for a specific reference listed drug product. 
These PSGs are published on a quarterly basis on the PSG website, as shown below. To help the industry develop complex generics, as negotiated in GDUFA 3, FDA has agreed upon priorities and goal dates on the development of the PSGs. Specifically, starting October 1, 2022, a PSG will be posted for 50% of the complex new drug applications within two years after the approval, and for 75% of the complex NDAs within three years of the approval. And these are very aspirational goals, especially considering the challenges of the complex drug product, which I will explain later. Now to meet this new goal, uh, we will need a process that is very efficient in identifying and addressing any potential complexities and hopefully initiate any needed research early in order to meet the goal. Now let's look at some of the challenges in developing PSG, especially for complex products. On average, there are close to 100 NDAs approved every year that may warrant the development of a PSG. Of those newly approved NDAs, about 25% are considered to be a complex product. As we have seen with some recent NDA approvals, the complexities can vary greatly between products and across disciplinary areas and can benefit greatly from a close collaboration across multiple FDA teams. The use of new materials, technology, and processes in these new drug applications also highlights the potential scientific gaps and the need for new and reliable analytical methods, which needs new research and innovation. And furthermore, in GDUFA 3, the new goal uh, set on the PSG development of the complex products may pose additional time constraints, especially if additional research is needed. So early engagement of research and review will be very crucial. And lastly, taking a life cycle approach towards the development of the generics necessitate a better communication and a collaboration across teams and within, uh, also with the industry as well. I will use one example to illustrate the importance of starting research early. As you may know, cyclosporin ophthalmic emulsion approval in early 2022 was a very notable example of the impact of the GDUFA research. Showing on this slide is a timeline of the approval overlapping with research as well as the PSG development. Research generated supporting data which allowed for assessment of product-specific quality attributes, best measurement practices, and assessment criteria to support the establishment of bioequivalence. However, it took nearly 10 years from the original NDA approval to develop scientific recommendations and another nine years to translate that to first generic approval. Needing such a long time to approve one drug are rare, but it does highlight the challenges with the research, especially the time that it may take, as well as the need to timely translating research findings into regulatory um, actions. And the question that we have asked is, how can we speed things up and doing it more efficiently? Prior to the GDUFA 3 rollout, FDA has established a new internal program to identify and direct research to support the complex PSG development. There are 10 subject matter expert teams specializing in various complex areas, with members scattered across nine CEDAR offices. Within the last two years, this pilot program has conducted 59 triage meetings on newly approved complex NDAs, and already identified eight that need additional research before a PSG can be developed. Now, briefly, a few more details about this program. It is established specifically to support the complex product PSG development. It includes relevant subject matter experts from both OGD and OPQ. And most notably, the program connects research staff directly with regulatory assessors as well as policy groups to discuss challenges and the needs for each newly approved complex NDA. The teams are created based on complexity areas such as ophthalmic, inhalation, and dermatological. So each team is very familiar with the topic area. Each SME team is tasked with making decisions on complexity and gaps to the PSG development and approval. If a gap is identified, the team also decides on the objective of the research. Afterwards, a dedicated research project is created 
to generate necessary evidence and to fill the knowledge gaps. And this could be a research project conducted internally within the OPQ lab, or could also be awarded externally through the Gudufa research program. We started piloting this program in 2021, and it became fully operational from the start of the Gudufa 3. As mentioned earlier, including the pilot phase, we've already completed 59 triages and already initiated eight research projects. Here is another view of the program in terms of the timeline. As we know, research can take time, so it is important that we start triaging the NDA product soon after the approval and through the triage process to narrow down the products, especially the complex ones that can benefit from targeted research. After we complete the research, knowledge gained during the research will need to be translated to recommendations, which will then be put into the PSG. And an example of the recommendations may include new methods or new approaches to demonstrating bioequivalence. I want to provide two examples of the SME triage. One is an ophthalmic emulsion of cyclosporine, and this product was approved in June of 2021, and the triage meeting was conducted in October of 2021. At the triage meeting, the SME team collectively decided that there is sufficient understanding from the previous research and its precedents, and therefore recommended immediate development of the PSG. As you can see, the PSG for this product was published in August of 2022, just 14 months since the NDA approval. Another example is a little bit more complex. This product is an ocular insert of dexamethasone with sustained release properties. The NDA was approved in November of 2018, and the decision from the triage team was that research is needed to better understand the product before we can recommend a BE recommendation. The identity gaps are primarily in the area of material characterization and in vitro measurements. And this work is currently ongoing, and we hope to complete it soon and share the findings with the public. As part of the Gudufa 3 commitment, the agency aims to further improve the forecasting of the PSG publication, which includes both the non-complex and complex products. And this helps the agency communicating the priorities as well as the timelines of the PSG development, which allows the industry to better plan their generic drug product development program. This forecasting list is updated every quarter, and the link is provided below. As you can see, Gudufa research has a very significant impact not only on the ability of the FDA to develop product-specific guidances and to support the pre and the program as well as and the, and the assessment, but it's also a valuable resource for the generic industry. In closing, product-specific guidance program provides FDA current thinking on the type of studies and information to support the development and approval of safe, effective, and high-quality generic drug product. Gudufa research plays a critical role in the generation of evidence and knowledge and supports the timely development of the PSGs. I want to thank a few people who helped me putting together the slides and also my colleagues at OPQ and OGD in contributing to the success of the PSG program. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you all for the great presentations at this time. We'll remind our presenters and panelists to attach their mics and turn on their videos for our live Q&A session. And as a reminder to our attendees, if you haven't had a chance to present your questions in the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We do have some panelists that are connecting the video and coming in. We'll give them just a few moments for that to take place. All right, we do have more panelists coming on board. We do have two up, and I think we're about three short as we're waiting here just a moment. And if you haven't submitted those questions, uh, if you have your favorite one coming in, please, uh, now is the time to submit them. All right, it looks like we have just about our entire panel there. We're going to move into our panel session. Our first group of questions will be for uh, Layla. Weezer, 
Leo Weezer, and here is the first question. Is there a single website from the FDA that describes all current guidance and compliance requirements for quality issues? Hi there, thanks so much for the question. Um, I think that's, that's a great one. Where's all the information at that we speak of? So uh, something that I just wanted to share with you all was on the FDA, the external uh, internet, uh, internet page, www.fda.gov. Uh, if you go on there, there's actually an entire section. Uh, it would be drugs. And then there's a section that you can click on with their left navigation for guidance, compliance, and regulatory information. And it will actually take you to guidances and drugs. Uh, from that page, there's actually a whole um, search option as well. And it, it would be by topic area. So some folks have asked also um, about quality specific documents. One of the drop downs, in fact, is pharmaceutical quality. Uh, but there are a number of, of other options as well, which you'll be able to see on that page. Um, so again, if going to the home page, going to drugs, then you'll be able to select guidance, compliance, and regulatory information. And go ahead and click on guidances and drugs, and you'll be able to then find the search function for that. Thanks so much. Thank you for responding to that question. I've got all six cameras on, on the screen right now. I want to take this opportunity to welcome to our panel, Susan Zuck, who's the Branch Chief, Division of Regulations, Guidances and Standards in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality and OPQ. Moving back to Layla we, Weezer, we do have a couple more questions. And here is the next question. Is there a table that links the regulations, guidance, and MAP or compliance program documents on the FDA website. And then thanks again for another good question. I think that really ties back to the conversation that we had about the regulatory framework. So how does everything connect together when we're trying to understand the story? And uh, to answer that, there's not a table per se, but that same website I was mentioning to you, it's a one-stop shop for those resources. So in addition to those guidances, and again, it's by topic, uh, we also have the link that takes you then to the external facing maps that are available, as well as the compliance programs that are available. Uh, looking at it, the search function by topic, we've done our best then in that regard to make it user friendly by topic. So you're not needing to look in multiple places for the policy, the policy documents. You can look at it by topic and by document type. Uh, so my suggestion, take a look at that page that I had mentioned earlier, explore, and it should be able to tell you that story by document type, but not only that, by topic, more importantly. So thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Layla Weezer in this round, and this is the question, can you elaborate on a, quote, draft guidance is not for implementation, since FDA inspection staff and review staff, quote, draft guidance documents in 483s, CRLs, and IRs? Thanks so much. Uh, so for that one, there was actually a number of questions. I want to make certain you know that we all um, hopefully address this with the one response, but that was a great example of the type of question that we were receiving about this. So uh, just as far, just for clarification, draft guidances, uh, while they're not final, they do provide insight into how we're interpreting our regulations and statute. So the basis for actions that FDA takes are really are ultimately pointing back to statute and regulation. So with non-binding guidance, it's, it's just that. It is non-binding, non -binding, but um, alternate approaches can be used. But we just want you all to be mindful that while a guidance is a guidance, it's providing the interpretation. There may be elements in a guidance that are directly pointing to requirements in a statute or regulation. And you'll be able to denote that because we have quotes or we have it sourced to what statute or reg it's pointing to. So there's really that opportunity. Um, it's clear when you're reading it then, uh, but we just want to make that clear. 
So um, that should have answered a number of questions in this space. Um, so thanks again for the questions so we can provide that clarity to the rest of the audience. Appreciate it. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a few questions that came in, one big one, for uh, <clears throat> Commander Mahesh Ramanadam. And here is the question for Commander Ramanadam. At a recent RAPS convergence meeting held in Montreal in early October, the experience shared by one presenter indicated that regulators, and this comments pertain to the FDA and Health Canada, are defaulting to regulatory categories as defined by the regs, except for very low risk changes. If you can provide additional feedback on what frameworks may be in the works to enable greater adaptability of the regs as regards uh, an ICHQ-12, it would be appreciated. Thank you for the question. Um, that's a very good question, in fact. Uh, I think, you know, speaking on behalf of FDA and our experience in CEDAR when it comes to the implementation of Q12, you know, what we've seen is actually the opposite. Um, we've seen applicants come in with proposals um, with uh, flexibility to the reporting categories with um, appropriate justification. Uh, and when they are appropriately justified, you know, as I showed on, on the slide, we'd approved uh, nearly 15 or so. Um, the situations where we were unable to reach alignment, uh, the applicants were not really in a position to provide scientific justification for the proposals. Uh, so it wasn't a situation where uh, we just couldn't see eye to eye on the proposed reporting category. It was really the, the science wasn't there to back it up. Um, but I am happy to say that when the science is there, we've found ourselves in the, in the position uh, to really take advantage of the flexibility in the US framework, uh, looking at 21 CFR 3.270 or 6112, the regs are built to inherently have uh, a lot of flexibility in what could be considered uh, any one of those particular reporting categories. So my, my feedback here is really, um, you know, the extent and the, uh, uh, the advantage that an applicant can get um, is really going to come down to how strong the science is uh, and how well they can present in their application. Uh, as far as frameworks, uh, you know, I look forward to our ongoing collaboration with other regulators, for example, the ICMARA pilots, or thinking about different Think about ways where we can align on uh, how we approach risk and how we look at particular changes, for example, with change management protocols. So I'll stop it there and give it back to give back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Commander Rama and Adam. We're going to move on to our next panelist. We only have about a little over 10 minutes left. We have a question that came in for Dr. Dongmei Lu. And here's the question for Dr. Lu. What do you think this approach will affect BCS2? or four? All right. Um, thanks for the uh, great question. Uh, here, uh, we just uh, talk about um, the oral drug products. And um, so BSS2, as, as you all know, that, is, uh, that has a uh, high um, uh, permeability and low solubility. So this uh, in vitro uh, bridging approach is, of course, you, know, you can use, apply to this uh, BSS2 drug product. Uh, but you need to consider that. And uh, because it's a high um, permeability, so likely the addition of a small amount of uh, antioxidants may not have a significant, significant impact on the uh, permeability or absorption. But in terms of the uh, uh, solubility, whether there are any kind of impact on its solubility or dissolution, and because the BCS it, it has a low solubility, so you need to consider and have a, a, a good test and to make sure um, the solubility um, is not, uh, and the release, the drug release is not impacted. And in terms of the BCS4 drug product, they, um, they are uh, low solubility and uh, low permeability drug products. So they are considered as a high risk drug products. In general, for this a high risk drug products, we would want to see more supportive information to support the uh, formulation changes. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We've got a question that came in for Dr. Pallavi Nithyanadan. And here is the question. Do USP monographs apply only to generic drugs and or drug products labeled USP? Thank you so much for the question. Um, the answer is no. If there is a USP, applicable USP monograph, it applies to all marketed drug products in the US and even products that fall under the 
OTC non-application system as well as unapproved uh, products would also uh, fall under the monograph requirements. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We do have a question that just came in for Dr. Xiaomen Xu. And here is a question for Dr. Xu. Since Q13A is considering harmonization of BE requirements, will FDA adopt Q13A instead of PSG? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm interpreting the question about Q13A is referring to the M13A. Um, for the bioequivalents for the immediate release uh, drug product. So uh, short answer is uh, they serve different purposes, uh, product specific guidance, outlining FDA thinking about the development, uh, including not only the bioequivalents, but also pharmaceutical equivalents uh, approaches that a company, a generic company should adopt uh, or recommend it to consider during the development phase. So uh, M13A is uh, uh, a general approach guidance uh, across multiple uh, regulatory agencies uh, outlining thinking about the BE specifically for immediate release uh, uh, formulation. So, uh, so what I was describing in the talk, uh, um, uh, emphasis more is on the complex formulations, uh, which is really not covered uh, under the M13A. Um, so thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a few questions on atrosamine that came in for Susan Zuck, and here is the first question. A new FDA guidance on nitrosamine impurity categories was published in August 2023, and there is also an FDA web page on possible ND SRI AI categories. Does FDA intend to periodically update the website of possible ND SRIs? Okay, good question. Thank you. I hope my sound is good. Um, yeah, that uh, guidance just published in August and it had uh, an accompanying website with AIs. Um, as the guidance and the website say, we, we know that this is an evolving science and we do intend to periodically update the AIs on that website. So keep checking. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a couple more questions for Susan Zuck, and here's the next one. Get on nitrosamines. The nitrosamine guidance dated February 2021, R1, indicated that FDA accepts LOQ at or below 0.03 part per million. Does this apply to all nitrosamines for various products? Okay, thanks for that question. Actually, um, FDA has been asked about that statement in the uh, nitrosamine guidance quite a bit. Um, when we published that guidance, we didn't have a lot of AIs for products. Of course, now we have this new guidance with far more AIs, and the AIs are higher than what we had in the original guidance. In that original guidance, we had published the LO, the suggested LOQ of 0.03 um, to, to let uh, industry know that they didn't have to go very, very low with their LOQ. We knew that the, the methods had to be very sensitive and if the LOQ had to be extremely low, that would be impossible for many manufacturers. That being said, now that we know that we can have some higher AIs, for NDSRI products, for example, um, limiting an LOQ to 0.03 is not necessarily appropriate and it certainly isn't necessary. And so um, in thinking about this, um, the agency is thinking that it might be best with those higher AIs to set the LOQ based on the AI itself. That's, that's our target analyte and that's our target limit. So a low, um, LOQ, that would be practical, um, consistent with Q2, ICHQ2 guidance, um, would be something around um, perhaps 10% or lower of the AI, and that would be an acceptable LOQ for some of those high AI products. Thanks for the question. 
Thanks for responding. We do have one more question for Susan Zuck, and here it is again on Atros means if any relevant ND SRI impurity cannot be synthesized, then this could be an indication that either does not exist or there is no risk of it being formed. In such cases, is it okay to skip the confirmatory testing? Thanks for the question. Um, I, I believe this question is probably referring to the hypothetical list, um, table one in the uh, new guidance. Um, because some of those NDSRIs are hypothetical, we know that it's possible that when an applicant um, does the risk assessment and tests for this impurity, they're going to find that maybe it doesn't form. And uh, we would encourage uh, applicants to actually see if they can form the NDSRI by stressing the API, uh, putting it under those conditions that would normally form the SI NDSRI, for example, combining it with a nitrite um, ingredient in order to try to force it to form. If it can't form, and if the applicant can show us that they have done their due diligence, that they have uh, taken experiments to try to form the NDSRI, then yes, um, it would be appropriate not to develop a method and routine testing for that NDSRI. But the applicant should show the, the agency that it really can't form in the product. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question. We've got just a little over two minutes left. We'll try to get a couple more in for Commander Mahesh Raman Adam. And here is the first question. Are the use of established conditions and reduced reporting categories limited to well understood small molecules or open to novel regenerative medicinal products? And in addition, would manufacturing processes that use advanced technologies such as AI also be eligible? Thank you for that question. Um, so in the context of scope and applicability, uh, Q12 is applicable to uh, small and large molecule products that are regulated by either the Center for Drugs or the Center for Biologics. So that include your um, uh, regenerative medicines as a potential example there, um, and device combination, drug device combination products. Um, as far as applicability, as far as like knowledge or um, uh, controls, uh, I think it's important to remember that Q12 is available to applicants of all applications, whether that's innovator products or generic products. Um, and they're not limited to those situations where, you know, someone is doing very advanced development or very advanced manufacturing. It can be equally employed uh, to generic products where, you know, an applicant might be relying more on platform knowledge uh, for products they've already manufactured or that they've gained for that particular drug product. Um, it's, you know, extremely flexible um, to come in and propose uh, established conditions for um, a particular application product. It doesn't matter what kind we're talking about. Um, so let me pause it there and give it back to you, Jen. Thank you for responding to that question. We have just under a minute left. We're going to try to squeeze one more in with Dr. Xiaoming Shu. And here is the question. For PSG development and publication, will FDA publish an official PSG while the RLD company against it with lots of difficult questions? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we always receive difficult questions at FDA. So, <laughs> um, and uh, I think the uh, short answer to that is uh, 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 the purpose of developing PSG doesn't mean uh, that FDA is ready to review or approve the application. It simply means that uh, we'll provide the recommendation to the developers uh, outlining the approach that they should take uh, to develop the product. So um, we oftentimes receive the feedback from the public, you know, sometimes can be from the IOD companies, but also sometimes can be from uh, another company uh, uh, proposing alternative method. Again, the PSG doesn't mean uh, approval. PSG doesn't mean uh, those are um, exact uh, recommendations that company need to follow. And the company still feel free to um, develop alternative approaches uh, as long as it can be uh, uh, supporting, uh, can be provided in their application to justify their proposed approach. Um, but uh, um, yeah, hope that, that answers the question. Thank you. 
Well, that's all the time we have for questions in this final Q&A panel for today. A huge thank you to our presenters and panelists for answering numerous questions that came in today. It's now our pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Fisher, who's the Director of Science Staff in OPQ, to provide us with some closing remarks. Please join me to welcome Dr. Fisher. Thank you so much, Ray. And thank you to the policy panel who just wrapped up, who gave us so much great information. Even though I work in this area every day, I just learned a few new things. I am Adam Fisher, Director of Science Staff, and I thank you all for joining us virtually here today in what I believe to be the premier global event focused on pharmaceutical quality. We hold this event every other year, and we take planning it very seriously trying to produce the best topics and speakers for our audience. And I hope you will join me in thanking today's speakers and panelists for their time and effort in making this event possible. Without them, we could not have done this. We started out today hearing from the FDA commissioner and the director of CEDAR's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality about the importance of what we're addressing here. We learned about quality assessments, including new technologies for assessment and the latest in evaluating facilities. Then we went in on all of the latest in pharmaceutical quality policy. We had wonderful audience, audience engagement in the Q&A today, which led to these robust panel discussions that I have really enjoyed. Now I ask you to join us again tomorrow. We'll start with a featured presentation on Project Orbis, which has really been a groundbreaking regulatory program, followed by sessions on supply chain and advanced manufacturing. If you're like me, you don't go more than a day without reading about one or both of these session topics in the press. So hear more about FDA's activities in these areas tomorrow. As a bit of a plug, I'll note that I'm speaking in the advanced manufacturing session tomorrow on a brand new development for the first time. I'm excited to see what tomorrow holds, and I look forward to engaging with you then. Please have a wonderful evening, night, or morning. Back to you, Ray.